What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into the Heat Shack Fantasy Podcast, powered by Number Fire. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for the Workday Charity Open that is at Muirfield Village, the first of two consecutive events at this course for the PGA Tour. We're going to break things down from a DFS perspective. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Brandon Gadula. He is a managing editor for Number Fire. Brandon Bryson DeChambeau got one in the win column him last week in fairly dominant fashion how you doing today uh good i mean it, it was nice to see bryson finally win um i'm a little uh worked up just because i i dread memorial week every, every year because of weirfield and yeah. i feel like i say it probably it, it sounds strangely. very weird and we got to do it two weeks in a in a row um or does it sound weird weird all right, that was it was a good podcast. I mean, we didn't get to everything. We good didn't get career. To everything. <laughs> I'm at Cadula thirteen. Uh, Jeez, but yeah, I mean, Bryson just kind of broke everything. Uh, that's all I knew anyone's really been talking about. Um, it, it's it, it's going to lead to some changes. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that works because it can't be like super quick implementation of changes, but. Do you think people can't Bryson. just magically get swole over three weeks like Bryson or three months like Bryson did? Uh, I mean, you'd be surprised at what a lot of uh, people could do if they had as much of a, a regimen and, and the protein amount. Um, I don't really ever talk about this, but I mean, you and I had a little bit of a, of a back and forth. And... We didn't have a back and forth. You just misunderstood what I was pointing out. Yeah, but like, okay, so... Bryson weighing what he does and being as active as he is should be drinking a lot of protein shakes. And, but he uh, drinks like six per day. The amount of protein it's, he needs to put on It's muscle. not about that. It's about protein shakes are disgusting, and he probably hates like every every second of every day. If you think protein shakes are disgusting, you need to upgrade your protein. No. I, I don't work out enough to justify <laughs> having them to begin I mean with. yeah if you get the if you get the cheap stuff uh it's it's terrible it doesn't mix it tastes I'm like sure Bryson chop. is skimping uh, yeah Bryson I'm sure he's a frugal guy yeah yeah uh, Bryson's got primo protein so he's not he's not worried about it I mean I don't know I'm just saying I it would like just saying I would not enjoy that experience very much if I had to consume that much that many protein shakes That's in a single takes day. The, win. The, the breakfast aspect of like five eggs and like whatever amount of bacon it was it sounds amazing. And I'd love to like live that life, but the protein shake sounds hideous. Nah, don't eat, don't eat before 1 p.m. You don't eat before like 7 p.m. So you're not even allowed to talk. Like I'm, I don't even know why I would bother discussing Bryson because <laughs> it's inevitably going to lead to ter- terrible takes by Brandon. This so is a- this is my fault. I have no one to blame myself here. This is not this even what- on you. It's on me. I keep so many of my takes just bottled up. Because you should. <laughs> it's where they should be. Let's just keep them there. Keep them deep down. And let's talk about this Workday Charity Open. As mentioned, this is the first of back-to-back events at Weirfield Village. We have this one-off event this week. And then the Memorial is next weekend. So if you want course history, look back at the Memorial. We will discuss be discussing course history during the podcast throughout the day. They apparently are going to make alterations to the course between events. So it will not be exactly the same course, but, you know, pretty even to what we've seen here in the past and what we'll see here again in next week. Muirfield, Muirfield Village. There it is. 7,392 <laughs> yards. It is a par 72 The top uh, 65 plus ties make the cut out of 155 golfers in the field. Again, cuts have been brutal ever since they came back from the COVID-19 layoff because there are so many guys in the field and we have to put a very heavy emphasis on just finding dudes who are going to make it through. Brandon, we are trying to identify said dudes. Which stats should we emphasize for Weirfield Village? Yeah, so, I mean, we, we know that this is going to host two straight events, so they're going to try to mix it up a little bit. They're, but I think there's only so much you can do with the golf course. Uh, the pin placements will be different. Uh, they're going to let the rough grow out for next week, which means you kind of can't really mow it for this week. So it's going to be kind of a, a you know tough rough, so you want to be able to hit fairways. But 
Uh, firstly, you know, Muirfield overall is a course that's shown an emphasis on approach more than we typically see at the PGA Tour level, according to data uh, from Data Golf. Uh, around 39% of scoring is explained by approach compared to about 35% on the tour as, as an average. Putting is a bit depressed as well, uh, down to about 32% from 36%. So, uh, this is good news for the heat check. Uh, and if anyone follows our, uh, advice ever, which I mean, hopefully they do sometimes, but not all the time. Uh, I think that this week is going to be something, uh, where the guys with great approach numbers, uh, do stand out, uh, as opposed to the putters, uh, the fairways are typically easy to hit, uh, but accuracy still matters. You can't be missing fairways whenever 70% of the drives in the field are hitting fairways, put you at a disadvantage. Uh, I think the bigger point still uh, is that approach in greens and regulation, very, very important than, uh, and, and even more important than being just super great off the tee. So my key stats this week are going to be stroke scan approach number one, as always, driving accuracy. Actually, stroke scan around the green is going to be important as well. Birdie or better rate and putting on bent grass. So Kind of the, the, the all-around tee to green stuff, but uh, j- I just don't want golfers who can't pick up strokes with their approach and can't hit fairways. Uh, so usually we're on the same page from a stats perspective, which leads us to targeting similar golfers. This week, we're not entirely on the same page from a stats perspective uh, because we had different processes, and I think yours is totally valid. Mine, to explain it once again, is I look at where golfers who finished well the previous year ranked in various stats for the full season on the PGA Tour. The intent there is to find archetypes. Which archetype of golfer does well at this course? And in 2019, the average ranking of the top 20 golfers uh, for the full season of the PGA Tour in distance was 82nd. They were 103rd or 102nd in driving accuracy. In 2018, it was more extreme. Uh, the average ranking in distance was 61st. Average ranking in accuracy was 99th. So I did wind up going distance over accuracy, over good drive rate, because, I mean, it is a long course, but also just because we've seen a lot of times golfers in the past who have been long hitters, have done well at this course. Like Cantlay last year, 21st in distance, 160th in accuracy, 148th in good drive rate. Uh, Hideki was up there. He's not a super accurate guy. Mark Leishman was up there. Jordan Spieth, accuracy, not a forte by any means there either. So I did wind up going with driving distance, but I'm also not going to like cross off anyone who isn't super long off the tee. So... I think it's kind of a blend for me. Like the main default stat for me is going to be distance. But if there's a guy who is $8,700 who is not super long off the tee but does have accuracy, like hypothetically Emiliano Grillo, like I could justify targeting him because accuracy, like you said, does matter. So I'm going to go distance by default, but I'm not going to necessarily cross guys off if they're not super long, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you can never really go wrong with guys who are long. Uh, yeah. it's hardly ever a detriment to be long, uh, unless, you know, you have some of those Bryson moments and can't figure out why the club's going uh, as long, uh, or, or as long as it did. But I think what's still most important to me is that any off the tee stats just don't matter as much as approach play, yeah. <laughs> just no matter how you slice it. So I might, I might be emphasizing accuracy compared to distance, but they both are very less, very much less important than approach and yeah. I think that's the the number one. We need greens and regulation. We need guys who can score. That does come from, you know, you can't be terrible off the tee, uh, but that mostly comes from, you know, pin seeking uh, with great approach uh, and actually making your putts. And we have some of the best approach players in the world uh, in this field. So it should be a fun conversation for today. We'll take a look back at past events at Weirfield Village in just one second. But first, the next UFC event coming up on Saturday. It's at Fight Island and FanDuel is celebrating the highly anticipated action with one of its biggest MMA contests yet. For just $8.88, enter FanDuel's $200,000 Saturday UFC Super Octagon and compete for your share of the $200,000 prize pool, including a $50,000 
$1 first place prize. Take your pick of all the top fighters and follow along using FanDuel's live scoring as the fights unfold. Someone is going to win at least a share of $50,000 on Saturday, and it might just be you. For more details, visit FanDuel.com or download the FanDuel app today. Eligibility restrictions apply. We'll have a podcast on UFC DFS tomorrow with Austin Swaim of Number Fire breaking down his favorite plays from a DFS perspective for Fight Island. It's like saying Fight Island. We need a golf island or golf on Fight Island. I, that yeah, I mean, there are a few islands. There are a few islands in play. Uh, it would be very nice uh, just from a safety standpoint if they found an island and just kind of played. Yeah. I still think I want to see Bryson fight someone on Fight Island. I think that's the that's the goal here eventually. But let's move into past history at Muirfield Village and check out golfers who have done well here in the past. And Brandon, a heat check favorite, has done well here. And I think that the way I can tell how I've done in DFS in past years at different events is, did Patrick Cantlay do well? If the answer is yes, I probably had a decent week. If not... Probably not. So I'm guessing things have gone well for me at the Memorial in the past because Patrick Cantley at Weirfield Village tends to perform very well. Yeah, I mean, look, we're, we're talking past history at, at Weirfield. Uh, Patrick Cantley has to be someone we talk about. The, he hasn't played here like a thousand times, which is sometimes what we get with uh, course history. But he's played here three times, so not a lot, but he's dominated. Uh, 35th, 4th, and 1st in his three starts. He did that by gaining 7.5, 12.1, and 14.6 strokes gained. Uh, T to green, uh, 2.9, 10.2, and 7.4 with his approach play. You can't really do a whole lot better than that uh, on a specific course. According to Fantasy National, he's gained strokes. Uh, T to green in 11 of those 12 rounds here. That's the highest rate of any golfer in the field at this course. And Really, only six others are above even 75%. Uh, Justin Rose uh, did it in 20 of 22, so about 91%. Uh, so, I mean, he's the only one who's really even above 85%. Uh, so, Cantlay's tee to green play here has been pretty much flawless. Uh, he came back and was 11th at the Travelers, which is his only PGA Tour start since the layoff. But a little bit of a problem there. Gained just 2.2 strokes tee to green and really saved himself with the putter, gaining 5.1. However, uh, we've talked about it a little bit. I think especially I've talked about it. I don't actually know where you land on this, but I don't care a ton about this super recent sample. We know that Patrick Cantlay statistically is a top five golfer in the world, uh, however you want to slice it. He is one of the few golfers who's great at all four tee to green or uh, strokes gain stats. So I'm going to side with the long, the long-term form the great track record at Muirfield, and I'm in on Patrick Cantlay at 11-7 on FanDuel. What about you? I'm in on him. The dilemma I have is whether I rank him above Justin Thomas because Justin Thomas is 12,000, uh, Cantlay 11-7, and you can fit in both, kind of like we had with Bryson and Webb last week. You can make that happen, and I will make that happen at times. But that's no fun to say both, uh, so I should pick between the two, and it's tough because... Thomas leads the field in approach the past 50 rounds. He's a tiny baby bit longer than Cantlay. Also has good course history here. A fourth in 2017, eighth in 2018. Miscut last year, but he's shown that he can do well at this course in the past. The differentiator could be the bent grass putting because Cantlay is better there than JT, and maybe that's a way to, to go with the tiebreaker. But I kind of view the long-term form on JT being a hair, a hair above Cantlay. So as much as I love Cantlay, I may still rank JT a little bit higher, but I think that those two, to me, are a tier above the field from the way I'm viewing them. So I think it's JT 1A, Cantlay 1B, and I would not fight anyone who, who switched those two, but I do think that they are the top two for me. How are you viewing Cantlay specifically relative to Justin Thomas? I mean, it's always hard to go against Justin Thomas because he's – Almost always the best tee to green golfer uh, in a field. The the issue is the putter, um, and all he needs to do is make some putts, and he can run away with pretty much any event, uh, and we've seen him do that. The consistency is more of the concern. With Patrick Cantlay, I mean, he's super consistent. He's almost as good tee to green uh, as Justin Thomas, so I have Cantlay as the 1A. If I, Well, let me, let me say this. I have Cantlay over Justin Thomas by just a bit, especially with the $300 savings, mm -hmm. but I actually kind of prefer someone else price relative to both of those guys. And I might start my lineups a little bit lower uh, with Xander Shoffley this week. 
Yeah, I think that's something that I'll be discussing later on, too, where I'm okay bypassing these top five. And I'm, the top five is through Hideki Matsuyama. Uh, bypassing those top five, going more balanced, I'm okay with that. But I also think that if I'm going with the studs, I think it's hard to turn down Cantlay. JT is right there, though. Uh, but it, it can't lay, there's I really can't put up a good argument against him, I think is the way that I'd phrase that. And he checks every box, which is hard to do generally. Yeah, I mean, you can't really go wrong with any of the top six. I don't, so any golfer uh, above 11,000 on FanDuel, I think that they're all in play this week to varying degrees. But this is not like last week when we were advocating trying to jam in Bryson and, and Webb. Yeah. Um, they were really the only two studs. Right. That's not the case this week. Yeah, I think that, um, again, I do view JT and Cantley above. Rom and Kepka and Hideki, yeah. but I'm also okay doing what you said, bypassing everyone and going with a more balanced approach. I think that's very in play for this week. Let's move on to Ricky Fowler, Brandon, because uh, Fowler kind of showed some life last week. Uh, he had a couple of missed cuts uh, and then had a 12th place finish last week and had a really good first couple of days. And Fowler gained 2.6 strokes in approach. That is his most since the waste management, which was earlier this year. So, it's just in time for Fowler bouncing back to play at a really good course for him. Uh, Ricky Fowler has played Muirfield 10 times. Pair of runner-ups here. One was in 2010, a long time ago, but the other one came in 2017. Since then, Fowler has finished 8th and 14th. Last year, gained 3.1 strokes in approach, and he gained 6.5 T to green the year before that. So the form is getting better, and the history is good. Those are positives for Ricky Fowler. The problem is that he's surrounded by a bunch of really enticing options. Uh, he is 500 less than Xander Schauffele. He is 200 less than Victor Hovland. Uh, Justin Rose is $100 more. We saw him uh, rebound a couple weeks ago. So Ricky is someone I am monitoring, but I'm not in enough to use him over those other golfers. Where do you sit with Ricky Fowler, Brandon, after an intriguing week last week? I think I'm out. Uh, if you go back and look at his finishes, which is not really how I analyze golf at all, but he's been like top 20, top 10 or cut. And there's really been no, like not a whole lot of in between uh, for Ricky Fowler. And if you go back through his data, the approach play has been above average. So he's gaining strokes with approach, but it's like 2.6 last week in a weak field. 0. 0.9, 0. 0.3 at the two tougher events he played uh, since the break. 1.1, 1. 1, 0. 0.6. And then off the tee, he's pretty neutral. Uh, so if you look at the ball striking specifically, he just hasn't done a lot to separate himself. We know that Ricky Fowler is one of the best putters on the planet, but he hasn't really even had any spike weeks uh, you know, since the return. I think overall, uh, Fowler is just overpriced. Uh, and as much as I love Ricky Fowler, I really don't have a I don't really feel the need to play him this week yeah I think that's where I'm at too is specifically because of where he's where his salary winds up just because it's a good tier and if I'm gonna go balanced like I'd rather spend down for someone like Joaquin Neiman or spend up for Hovland Xander uh so Fowler worth monitoring see if he can keep that approach play up uh but not enough where I can buy in yet and I, I, worth discussing here too because of his plus history at this course but not enough for us to buy in. So let's talk about a couple of cheaper golfers here, Brandon, with plus history at Weirfield. One of them is Jason Duffner. Duffner, $8,200, really low salary. Uh, what do you see with him in past events here at this course? Yeah, $8,200 for Duffner, coming off a missed cut, um, which he lost strokes everywhere but off the tee. Uh, I know I'm not putting stock into a two-round sample. I, I have learned my lesson by now. Uh, but... You know, when Duffner's gone to a course where he's thrived in the past, I think that we should look at him a little bit closer. At Muirfield, he's finished 19th, 24th, 33rd, 1st, cut, and 7th. He won here in 2017 despite losing strokes with the putter. That's because he gained 10.7 with approach, 16.5 overall tee to green. I just, Victor Hovland could probably gain 16.5 strokes tee to green, even lose some strokes. Come on, come on, Vic. Get, I want you to get one, but uh, over 22 rounds at Muirfield, Duffner's average 2.1 strokes uh, tee to green, which is third in the field behind only Patrick Cantlay at 2.9 and Justin Rose at 2.2. Uh, he's 17th in approach over the past 50 rounds in this field. I think that if we were really trying to find value, Duffner is someone to put on the list. 
I don't love the play. He might actually be a little bit popular because of the uh, course form. Any thoughts popping up with Duffner? Um, not really. I think because it's partly because I am emphasizing distance a bit, and Duffner's not someone who's going to grade out super well there. And you could say, well, he's done well here in the past despite not having that. So that could be a very easy rebuttal. But I think that there are some guys who are not negatives there who are also in a similar salary range and in some instances even cheaper than Jason Duffner. Um, so I don't need to use Jason Duffner and settle for okay form. I can go for someone, like maybe go back to Cameron Tringali once again this week. He's $8,200. Uh, Sung Yul No actually kind of was interesting um, coming off of that mandatory military service. He's had good approach numbers the past few events, so I spent some time digging into Sung Yul No. Uh, Sebastian Munoz is 8,000. So there are actually golfers in the low 8,000, high 7,000 range who I don't hate, which is not very normal for me. Um, and I think that I'd rather go with their direction because those guys I listed all at least have some distance, whereas Duffner really doesn't. So I think. If I do wind up going down there, I'm going to gravitate towards those other names I listed rather than Duffner just because I like the the pop they bring to the table over what he has. Yeah, so I mean, I think ultimately I'm going to go a little bit more balanced this week mm -hmm. um, because this field drops off pretty quickly. Uh, uh, I do, uh, on the same note, I think that there are some golfers who are just underpriced. Mm -hmm. Duffner, I'm not saying he's underpriced. Uh, I, I'm really not going to use him a ton. Uh, but we do have options down here. And so I might experiment with some, like a balanced lineup with five golfers and then one sort of punt play. Because I do yeah. think that there are golfers uh, worth targeting down here. Uh, specifically, Sebastian Munoz at $8,000. Uh, Carlos Ortiz is $7,600. Um, I think he's missed two of the three cuts, but he's gained an approach, you know, in all of those. So he's interesting. Uh, I think that maybe gone are the days where you try to get like three studs and three yeah. values in the same lineup. So I, I know I'm a little bit rambly here, but I think that this is actually an intriguing range. So long as you minimize your exposure and actually consider maybe just having some balance and then one, like one cheap option and see what happens. Yeah. I think I'm on board with that too. Um, I think it's a, uh, especially with the way that the different salary tiers shape up, it's kind of similar to what you said last week, where there wasn't a big gap between the low 9,000 range and the like upper 8,000 range or so. I don't think there's a huge gap between the upper 8,000 range and the lower 8,000 range this week. So I am okay taking the, the solo punt option and going balanced in there. I think that is something I would also be intrigued about doing this week let's talk about kevin streelman brandon because streelman coming off a runner-up two weeks ago he gained 4.4 strokes in approach and this is a course specifically where streelman has gone nuts in that department recently overall streelman has three top tens at weirfield two of those have come in the past four years and last year when streelman finished fourth he gained 9.3 strokes on approach alone we know that he can do that because he's a very good approach player finished 44th the year before that uh but that was despite gaining five strokes in approach in that one so streelman's not particularly long off the tee and he was struggling before that runner-up finish that he had recently but is there enough here for you to take a run at streelman at ninety six hundred dollars uh, I mean, again, I, I don't like to analyze things based on finishes, but have you seen his like recent performances? Uh, it's a lot of, it's a lot of cuts. Yeah. So second last week after three cuts, 42nd or 47th second cut, 45th cut, cut, cut. Uh, there's two cuts, a fourth and three missed cuts. All I've heard that. was three top fives in the past eight <laughs> or so. Oh, That's man. all I heard. Um, so he, he can he can miss some cuts. Uh, that's so tough because we need to emphasize making cuts. Uh, and I, be I firmly believe that we should be looking at, at strokes gain, like T to green as opposed to missed cuts. For him, it's been okay, but he's hovering around like, the field average, which is not enough. 
I think it's a big risk. I think it's a an unnecessary risk. Uh, I won't talk anyone out of it, but I don't think that I'm going to to handcuff a lot of my lineups with Kevin Stroman. He might be a better bet, maybe for a top ten, but I don't think I'm going to play Stroman. What I think if you? I'm going to go at that archetype, I'm going to jump down or jump up. Um, so, like, if I want to go at someone who can do really well tee to green but could just absolutely bomb a lineup, I'm going to jump down to, like, Corey Connors, Joel Damon, who are, in my eyes, the same golfer. Um, <laughs> so I would jump down to them or jump up to Joaquin Neiman. Um, so I think that I can get a Streelman type without using Streelman himself and at a different salary tier. So although I think that Streelman is interesting, he's not someone I'm probably going to wind up using a whole lot this week. I just wanted to bring him up because of the, the positive course history. But I think that you can get a Streelman-esque golfer for a cheaper salary, and I am okay taking that discount. Yeah, I mean, we have Damon, uh, Corey Connors, Harold Varner, and Jason Kokrak, like between 91 and 93. I'm not... I'm not in on Coke Rack again yet. Still not back yet. 91. That's below the the Coke Rack yeah, threshold. 90, yeah, <laughs> he's below 93. Although I looked it up and he's very rarely $9,300. No, he's always 93. Don't lie to me. Well, he's either he's been either like 10-1 or 9-1 lately. Well, it's a lie. Uh, you have false data. He's always $9,300. And I refuse to believe uh, the lies coming out of your mouth. But I do think that the low 9,000 range is interesting, and I'd rather not take that risk with Streamlin. I'd rather take that risk while spending less salary if I'm going to do it. So let's move on here to current form. Uh, golfers either doing really well or not so well I- I recently. And John Rahm might actually fit in both buckets, weirdly. So let's talk about John Rahm. You're going to talk about Rahm. I'm going to talk about Kepka. We could talk about these top fives of the whole. So let's start things off here with Rahm. What have you seen with him recently? Yeah, it's really interesting because we have to get. We, I mean, we have to hit on the high end golfers, um, and we talked about Justin Thomas and Patrick Cantlay already. Kind of glossed over John Rahm at eleven eight. Uh, so I think that we really should talk about him as the second most expensive golfer in the field, behind only Justin Thomas. Rahm's form is pretty interesting. He's been cut at the Charles Schwab when he lost four point two strokes putting. I got back on him the the following week for the Heritage. He finished 33rd, which is fine, but not what you want from someone who cost us a lot of salary on FanDuel. There he gained 2.9 strokes tee to green, which is fine. It's not great. At the Travelers, Rom finished 37th, losing 4.3 strokes with his approach, gaining 4.9 back around the greens, which is really not good. I mean, it's not... It's going to look good tee to green, but the approach number is far more important. And it's not that, I'm again... I'm not putting stock into that. It's just he might not be there as much as someone like Justin Thomas or anyone else we want to buy in uh, for this short sample. If I looked at that particular sample for a lower salaried, less proven golfer, I'd be like, I don't really see it. Uh, I don't think that he's there. But this is John Rahm. We know that the long-term form is very good. Uh, We know that he's sixth in this field off the tee. Uh, 27th in approach, 31st in distance, and 28th in fairways gained. So he could really set up well for Muirfield. He did miss the cut here back in 2017, but I don't care about that at all. He's good on Ben Grassapoa. I mean, if you want to talk to me about Kepka, and then we can kind of sure. circle back. All right, let's do that. I, right, I, so, I'm kind of in on John Rahm, though. So on a similar vein where it can be – it recently has been tough to predict John Rahm. It's always tough to predict Brooks Kepka. Um, it's probably a futile effort to try to predict Brooks Kepka, but he was mashing it two weeks ago. And with distance on at least my list this weekend, I think he's worth discussing. Uh, it, what? It's a, it's an always sunny joke, which you, you don't watch enough to, to get. I'm never going to understand it. All right. Uh, anyway, in that one last week or two weeks ago, Kepka gained 6.9. There you go. Strokes off the tee. Uh, That was the most he has had in a single event since the Open last year where he finished fourth. Kepka just neutral on his approach. But as we saw last week with Bryson, if you just absolutely obliterate the ball, there's not as much of a need for you to be good with your approach play. Kepka, he's been off two weeks after his caddy tested positive for COVID, but 
distance matters to me this week. Uh, Kepka is a good bent grass putter, and he's he's a very reasonable eleven thousand five hundred dollars. So, does Kepka do anything for you here, Brandon? And I guess you can loop uh, with Rom, Rom too. I think that they're not on the same level. I think Rom is a much uh, easier justification. Uh, Rom has actually been a really good putter, um, although. As much as I love John Rom, his approach numbers aren't amazing, hardly ever. Um, he does a lot of that with the off the tee play, but Kepka's approach play has just been very rough over 2020. Uh, according to Data Golf, they have like a, a field adjusted stroke gain numbers, and Kepka's actually lost an approach in 2020, which is not what you want to see. Uh, he's actually been as good tee to green as Lucas Glover. <laughs> like, well, I mean. Yeah, it's not a fair comparison because Lucas Glover is the best golfer on the planet. Okay, so Brooks has been worse tee to green than Jim Furyk. Again. <laughs> Adam Hadwin. Again. Uh, I mean, so. Find me Brooks a bad Cap- golfer in that group. Uh, well, he's just above Luke List. Okay. So he's you outperforming the, the nope, world's best it. golfer. You did it. You got it. <laughs> You did. Wait, is Luke List a bad golfer now? No, he's not a bad golfer, but I'm not going to put him in the same stratosphere as as our, our boy Jerk. Lucas Glover. No, nah, uh, Jim Jerk was a joke. But um, so Brooks can win. Uh, we know that. Um, but if you're making an actual case based on any sort of data or uh, uh, the the larger sample, he doesn't really stand up to John Rom. Uh, I don't know if he stands up to even Hideki right now. Mm. Um, so I think See, Brooke... I think I disagree with that because I think that if I'm using Brooks, it's not in cash games. It's in a tournament. So it's strictly a tournament discussion. And between Brooks and Hideki, who has the better odds to be a, a can't-miss golfer for the weekend? To me, it's Brooks. So I'd rather use Brooks and Hideki by a pretty wide margin. Um, I can see that Hideki's been quite consistent. I know that, look, if you're talking tournaments, you're probably talking, you want to win. Yeah. Um, I want Hideki the potential higher... for a win. Yeah. I think Hideki always has the potential to win. Yeah. Um, converting on the wins is another thing. Uh, but if you're fine burning a lineup because you're, you have $11,500 and you love your other five and you're playing for a tournament, Plug in Brooks over Hideki, sure. Uh, it could go terribly. Um, all I'm saying is, based on what I see from him, and even the long-term form, like the just the long-term approach is not good. And he's just someone who can be amazing when he's dialed in, but when he's not, he's fine just not being dialed in, and you don't want to spend that kind of salary on him. So tournament only. You don't think that Brooks is going to get up for the Workday Charity Open? That's kind of what I've been dancing around. Um, he's probably just trying to work on some stuff. So, whereas I, I think Hideki would love to win. Again. I think, like, from a range of outcomes perspective, like, the long tail on Brooks is a lot higher than Hideki. And that's why I wind up there. I think if we're talking from a predictability perspective, I'd rather go Rom. Um, and if I mentioned earlier, I'd rather have JT and Cantlay, but I think, I think I would put Brooks ahead of Hideki by a decent margin personally. I don't know what a long tail is. I think I can kind of like, it's a weird, like news or like TV consumption thing. And I don't want to discuss it. Okay. It's a very complex, it's not complex. It's just very stupid to explain on a, a fantasy golf podcast. So search for the long tail. So for you, you are JT, JT Cantlay, Cantlay, Brooks, Rom, Brooks, Hideki. Oh, uh, you still have Rom above Brooks. Okay. Yeah. All right. And you are the same, except Cantlay above JT and Hideki above Brooks. Um. Yeah, I still think Hideki's uh, viable because of the the safety. Although, again, <laughs> I prefer Xander to Hideki Brooks. Possibly even Rom for the price difference. I agree with that as well. Um, so maybe we'll talk about Xander later. Do you have any player picks? 
Yeah, you do. Okay, cool. So we'll talk about him later, but I agree with that assessment. You know it's about an an 85% chance I'm talking about Xander. Well, it's either you or me, so that's the way it goes. Let's talk about Cam Champ, because Brandon, I am emphasizing distance this week, but you are the person who decided to write up Cameron Champ's current form, $9,600. Uh, what have you seen with Cameron Champ recently? We've kind of seen the best from what Cam Champ can offer in his two starts since the hiatus. Uh, Champ's finished 14th at the Charles Schwab, 12th at the Rocket Mortgage. Uh, he gained on average five strokes, tee to green in each, uh, and he's had some positive putting. Uh, I'll clarify, it's nothing that's carried him to those finishes, but it's not as bad as what we typically see from someone like Cam Champ. Uh, if you kind of go back through his you know, event-by-event event log, his putting is a little bit all or nothing. He's kind of gaining three strokes, losing three strokes. Of course, there's some stuff in between. But uh, if you're looking for upside, you do need some volatility as a putter where someone can reach a bit of a high end. So if he can gain four strokes and be really good tee to green, that's what you need to do. Uh, we can talk about Bryson all we want, but Bryson led the field in strokes gained putting. I know that he had a lot of shot link issues, but I don't I haven't seen anything that it affected his putting. Uh, so if you lead the field in, in strokes gain putting, it's going to be good. I definitely would never, ever, ever uh, predict Cam Champ to lead a field in putting. But um, he's kind of shown some some reason to believe in a high-end performance. Unfortunately, he's been bad on bent grass in his career. But the Charles Schwab was on bent grass, and he gained 2.8 strokes putting there. Uh, he's a field leader in distance, obviously, uh, he, but he's 102nd in fairways gain, so he doesn't really fit exactly what I'm looking for. I want accuracy. Missed the cut here a year ago uh, with a negative game everywhere except off the tee, but you know, we're talking upside. Uh, if we are talking upside, I think Cameron Champ still works here. Um, I don't think that he's a, a super safe pick after two straight top 15s, but I do have a lot of interest in Cam Champ at 96, so uh, what do you see from him? Yeah, I think that the upside that you mentioned is intriguing. And as mentioned, I am emphasizing distance this week. So that should put me on Cam Champ, who literally leads the field in distance over the past 50 rounds. So that should put me on Cameron Champ. I said that. I know. I wasn't listening. Um, <laughs> I was pulling up data so I could talk to you about Champ. I was I, I know. being productive. I, I know, but it's funny. I was being productive. Anyway. <laughs> Did you? Okay, whatever. Anyway. <laughs> shush, 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 shush. Anyway. So I, in theory, am in on Cameron Champ. The issue that I run into is that if I'm going to use him, it needs to be in a tournament because, like you said, he could easily lose three strokes putting on Thursday and just be out of the running completely. And if I'm going tournament focused, I want to use Cameron Champ when he's not super popular. And right now he's tied for fifth in fan share tags. So the odds that Cameron Champ winds up being not popular are low, and that bugs me. Um, so I think that I want to be in on Cameron champ, but I want to be on him specifically when he's not going to be a popular pick. And I'm not entirely sure that's going to be this week. So I, I was initially in on champ until I pulled up the fan share tags. Now I'm okay jumping ship for this week. Uh, so monitoring, but hopefully in a couple of weeks I can get in on him without the issue like if he misses the cut this week and is in the field next week then it could be a cam champ week how about that um sure his price will probably drop i haven't talked about this but i think the the real play next week is going to be uh rostering golfers who were in this field and didn't do well and people exactly. just forget about that them. was what i was hoping about with champ um yeah, I mean, so if, if Cameron Champ's popular, uh, I think that we can kind of downplay it and just kind of let him be somebody else's problem because yeah. he's about a coin flip to make the cut. The just the difference, in case anyone's still new to golf and is like, well, Bryson won and was like, I think, forty six on 46%. What? That is high. Yeah. I think that's what it was on, on FanDuel, but yeah. um, the difference is Bryson had about an 85% chance to make the cut and like a... Saying Cam Not, Champ doesn't like, have an 85% chance to make the cut? No, I have him at 49.8. Um, right. <laughs> like I said, a coin flip. So that's the key difference. Owners, yeah. are, like, you know, popularity matters um, yeah. whenever golfers miss the cut. <laughs> yep. So probably not a Cam Champ week yet, uh, but hopefully he misses the cut this week. I mean, not for him. <laughs> I would love for him to be happy and have success and get that money. 
but for our purposes, and we can buy in next week. Let's talk about Ryan Armour, because Armour, riding a streak of back-to-back top 10 finishes, he has been 6th and 4th in the past two events, and just $9,000, uh, but still having a hard time buying in. The outing last week for Armour was legit. He gained 6.7 strokes tee to green, gained 5.3 on approach, and that's good, but the 6th place finish the week before was almost exclusively because he gained 7.2 strokes putting. And Armour is a terrible bent grass putter, so I'm not going to expect him to gain 7.2 putting anytime in the near future. Armour, 73rd in the field and approached the past 50 rounds. I'm emphasizing distance, and he doesn't do that. So despite the back-to-back top 10s and a $9,000 salary, I am still having a hard time buying into Ryan Armour. Uh, Is he going to wind up on your list this week, Brandon? No, I don't. I don't think so. Um, we want. I want to to value the long term form over the short term. Seeing two straight top six finishes should probably. I don't. I can't imagine Ryan Armour ever being someone people flock to to play. I but have for the salary, not not <laughs> this week, but I have previously. He's also he's got nine tags on fan shirts, so you know it's a decent number. I don't know how that ranks uh, currently. Uh, tied for 22nd. Okay. So I think really with the way that the fields are currently, there are only about, there are only ever going to be about five golfers whose, uh, you know, draft percentages really matter. So he's not going to get to that point. The bigger point is that I don't really want to roster someone who's got like a slightly negative ball stroking, uh, ball, ball striking profile. Um, is all these missed cuts. I'm not going to, I'm not going to play them. Yep. Me neither. So let's move on to the bookmaker odds for the workday charity open. Uh, Justin Thomas, the favorite right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. He's 12 to one. Then we have a cluster all around 15 to one. Those guys are John Rahm and Patrick Cantley, both right at 15 to one. Brooks Kepka 16 to one. Hideki Matsuyama, 17 to one. Xander Shafley is 21 to one. Followed by Victor Hovland at 22 to one. Then we get to Justin Rose at 26 to 1, Colin Morikawa and Ricky Fowler, uh, round at the top group there at 33 to 1. We talked about the top five, so let's look at that second group. So basically, Xander Schauffele at $11,200 on down. Who stands out to you, Brandon, is giving you the best odds to make a run at those top five golfers from a DFS perspective? Xander, um, pretty easily. Uh, I have him number one on my stats model, I have him fourth in win odds uh third in win odds i think yeah third um he's been so good uh with his tee to green play and he's he's a you know solid putter as well he's one of the few golfers who is like noteworthily good in all four categories he has good uh bent grass putting splits he's 27th there so i think that xander is uh a great play this week and I I definitely want to get Patrick Cantlay. I want to get some Justin Thomas, although I might miss out on Justin Thomas. Um, I want to take a stab at John Rahm, but if I'm building one lineup, uh, and spoiler alert for our head-to-head, I might just start with Xander, take the savings, and free myself up a little bit. Uh, that's where I am with him. Uh, aside from Xander, who's kind of... Uh, you know, a little bit more expensive than everyone else, it would be Victor Hovland for me, whose tee to green play has just been so good. And this has been a course where putting hasn't mattered a ton, which is probably exactly what Victor Hovland needs. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think that's kind of where I'm at too, where I, I like I like lineups that start with Xander and Hovland because I see a path to both of them doing really well. And it gives me less exposure to bad tiers. And I think that's a thing that I'm valuing. So I, and I can also get back up to a guy like Joaquin, even at 10,000, which I think is really intriguing. So um, that's a strategy I'll be taking for sure. And I think that uh, it is a plus strategy for this week. And I'd agree in the ranking there where Xander needs to be number one, Hovland number two, whose odds have shifted since things opened. And everything, everything's shifted uh, effectively, but who has been the most interesting? Um, I think that Patrick Cantley went from co-favorite with Justin Thomas at 12 to one to 15 to one is noteworthy. Uh, Brooks fell from 14 to 16, Hideki from 14 to 17. 
Uh, Patrick Reed from 35 to 40 is interesting. I think he's a good fan to play this week. I think that uh, he actually shows a lot of uh, expected value in my win simulation. So I think as an outright bet, he makes sense. Uh, Joaquin Neiman fell from 40 to 45. Matthew Fitzpatrick all the way from 50 to 65 is interesting. He's viable on FanDuel. And I think, I, I mean, I, I'm not there with Fitzpatrick where I want to bet him for an outright, but uh, whatever the top 10 number ends up being on him is probably going to be uh, pretty an- interesting. Uh, Matthew Wolf uh, from 60 to 75, same as Cameron Champ, who actually, um, we haven't mentioned this, uh, leads the field in distance over the past 50 rounds. Uh, Jason Day uh, fell from, uh, or he's down to 85 from 75. Corey Connors from 80 to 90. Uh, Harold Varner shortened from 100 to 90. And Ben On, Byung Hoon On, uh, shortened from Whoa. 80 to 75. There's a name I haven't heard in a in a minute. Um, I have a defunct, I hope, Masters ticket on Byung Hoon On <laughs> from <laughs> for the COVID-19 layoff. I'm hoping the DJ one is still active. I have not checked the rules at, uh, at Caesars, but we'll... Uh, Hoping the Ben on one may have gotten canceled, uh, but I think I think that him shortening is interesting. On has good history at this course, and I'm guessing that's probably what's dragging things down because I personally haven't seen a whole lot in him since the end of the night, the COVID nineteen layoff to draw me back in. Uh, are you in on Byung Hun On? Uh, so with On, we know what he is. It yeah. is a great T to green player without putting uh some of the stuff he tweets about his putting is is <laughs> very he's very self-aware oh yeah he knows um but if we can de-emphasize putting a little bit uh it's it's noteworthy yeah i just i'm done i'm done loading up on byung hoon on and yeah. i'm done trying to justify betting him outright because sure is he good enough to win a PG tour event. Yeah, absolutely. Are you going to predict it? Probably not. Especially when he, I mean, so his strokes gained putting is the, the past five positive 0. 0.7, negative 6.3, <laughs> negative 3.3, negative 9.2. Oh my gosh. What a gem. I just wish he could correct that one thing. He had a negative six in there. Two before that, negative seven point two. I mean, you just you take yourself out of it. No matter how good you are, T to Green. I desperately hope our boy figures this out. He's gonna win this week. Our beautiful boy. If he does, I'll still be happy. He's one of the few guys where, like, even if I'm not on him and he wins, I'll be happy. Kind of like Luke List back in the day, but (laughs) you know, I would prefer if he won my rosters. But he's probably not gonna be there this week. Uh, Which lower salary golfers have odds that stand out to you? Um, there's not a ton. Uh, the only golfer with odds better than 100 to one and below 9,000 on Fanduel is Maverick McNeely at 75 to one and 8,900. So, I mean, he's a really good putter, but other than that, uh, not really in on Mav McNeely. Um, Brent Snedeker, Matt Wallace, Brendan Steele, Russell Henley, Chris Kirk, Mackenzie Hughes are all 100 to one. Max Homa is 110, same as Ryan Armour. None of those names really make me feel excited um, for this week. I think Max Homa's interesting. I think Homa's interesting. I don't mind Brendan Steele. I am not in on Maverick McNeely. I don't think anybody else does anything for me at all. As far as you know, FanDuel plays go, there are a few golfers I'm willing to take a chance on. Yeah, But I might as well save an yeah. extra... 800 600, yeah yeah so i'm i really think a balanced lineup is the right way to go this week or i'm gonna experiment like i said with one punt play yeah because there are two golfers at eight thousand or below uh i talk about them all the time Car- carlos ortiz and sebastian muñoz T to green i think that they make a lot of sense to take a chance on and if they make the cut and you hit on the other five i think it's a really high upside lineup but I think a balanced lineup is the way to go, which is very different than what we recommended last week. Yeah, and I'm the two I'm looking at most are, or three, I guess, are, are Munoz, No, and Tringali. So 
also have options down there that I'm at least interested in exploring too. Weather for this weekend, nothing too bad. Uh, chance of rain Friday in the afternoon with the winds increasing to around 8 miles per hour, so nothing big. Uh, the odds of rain only about 25% right now. So I check back on that Wednesday to see if it will be something that will affect the plan Friday. The wind will get a bit elevated on Saturday, but not high enough where you need to take a look at wind splits. And on Sunday, another chance of rain in the later afternoon. So we could get wet a bit this weekend, uh, but as of now, there are no definitive takeaways from a weather perspective. No need to stack tea times or anything. So check back on the forecast on Wednesday night and see if things have changed in that regard. Let's move on to our player picks for the Workday Charity Open. Brandon, who is standing out most to you in the upper salary tier? I'll stick with Patrick Cantlay, who did open, uh, or at least when I first looked, was you know a co-favorite with Justin Thomas at at, at twelve to one. I thought that made sense, but uh, Cantlay lengthened, so I think that maybe that means people will just play Justin Thomas over over Cantlay. Although Cantlay's great form here is probably going to keep him in the mix uh, toward the top of the draft percentage board. But Cantlay's just one of those golfers who's above average in all four strokes gain stats. Uh, he's been really good at Muirfield. That's why we talked about him uh, at the top of the show. 35th, 4th, and 1st in his three tries. He's third in my stats only model. Um, he's fourth in my win simulations, which makes it seem like why do I prefer him it's more uh, I love the the fit and I love the stats for Cantlay and the price being a little bit cheaper uh, than what we get with Justin Thomas so um, the only really the only concern is that he came back and was uh, carried by his putter but again I'm trusting long-term samples and very few golfers uh, specifically in this field have a better uh, claim to great long-term form than Patrick Cantlay does. I think the one guy who could have that is maybe Justin Thomas. Let's talk about him. My favorite high salary guy, Thomas, lost 2.8 strokes in approach in his most recent events. Uh, that's a concern, but as mentioned, we shouldn't care too much about a single event, and Thomas was awesome before that. Uh, in the two events post-COVID-19 before that, uh, one bad event, Thomas had gained a combined 13.4 strokes tee to green and 10.9 in approach. Really good numbers, and those we're in events where his distance didn't matter as much, and I think it does this week. He's 10th in the field in distance the past 50 rounds, first in approach, 13th in scrambling. So, yeah, Bankgrass is the worst putting surface for Thomas, but he's still neutral there. Uh, so I'm going to put him at the top of my list this week, right above Patrick Cantlay. Uh, Brandon, any final thoughts for you on those those big five for this week? I really don't mind any of them. Uh, I'm fine if you prefer Justin Thomas He's a very easy justification. I just think that Patrick Cantlay stands out a little bit more to me. Okay. Uh, who stands out to you else in the, I guess, the second tier? Maybe we'll phrase that. Yeah, so I think that Xander Schauffele at 11-2 is my favorite play of the week. Mm -hmm. uh, he's just another one of these golfers who does really everything well, tee to green and on the greens. Uh, no golfer is better when I, when I kind of weight things in my stats-only model. Uh, I'm at 5.4% likely to win, uh, which is third, just just behind Justin Thomas and John Rahm. I've got nothing against those two, or Cantlay, or Brooks, or Hideki, like I said, but Xander's cheaper. Uh, we're getting him on a great putting surface for him on bent grass. He very easily can win. And for how good he's been, he statistically should have won by now. Uh, and I think that this week is potentially his week. And I think that if you look at like a the the stats profile of Xander, it's really hard to get more balanced than he is. You mentioned you know he does everything well. That's true. Um, there's really no one else in this field who is as balanced as him. So I agree that he is worth prioritizing this week. Even though I do like guys like JT, like Cantlay, I will have them together with Xander at times. But I also want to make sure I have balanced lineups, as you alluded to. Another guy who fits well in that balanced lineup is Victor Hovland because. We've always kind of assumed that Hovland's short game struggles are a fixed negative that will not change, but might not entirely be true because it is a super, super small sample, just 25 rounds, but Hovland is actually slightly above average as a punter, as a, as a putter on bent grass. 
not a big enough sample to draw conclusions, but it's enough to be noteworthy, and it's better to be positive in a small sample than negative, I guess. And it's especially true with how unreal the ball striking has been for Hovland. He has gained at least 5.7 strokes tee to green in every event since the end of the COVID-19 layoff, and he's been at 9.6 or higher in two straight events. So if Hovland doesn't totally tank with the putter, which the data says is possible, he should pay off again at 10-9. So I'm going back on Hovland once again this week. Uh, Brandon, any additional thoughts for you on Victor Hovland at 10-9? I love him. I think that a Hovland-Xander start is probably, if I'm building one lineup, it's probably going to be that. Um, I wanted to double-check this, but yeah. So Hovland led T to green last week. And at the Travelers, which yeah. makes it too straight where he's led tee to green. Just the putting has been bad. If we de-emphasize putting a little bit, it's really easy to like Victor Hovland. So, look, we, we've talked about the top five um, and how we feel about them. But if you ro- if you try to roster one or two of those golfers, you really have to be willing to spend down. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's the right play for your primary lineup this week. So I'm going to take the savings and and just tell you straight up, I'm going to play Xander and Hovland in our head to head lineup. I'm going to tell you straight up. I'm probably going to block you with Xander, but I'm going to have a different construction. So (laughs) Xander's just going to be a wash this week. That's just how it's going to be. Uh, Let's move down to the middle tier on FanDuel. Who stands out to you for this weekend? This is a, I mean, even this tier, I start to feel like the 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 low ten thousand is a range we really didn't discuss a ton. Um, yeah. With Morikawa ten six, I think he's fine for a bounce back. Patrick Reed, I said I like. Sungjae, very easy to justify as a bounce back, but it gets a little iffy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so maybe so maybe you could say like, why would I want to build a bounce lineup around a lot of these golfers? The difference between some of these golfers and what you get. In the 8,000 range is very, very different, so that's kind of where I am. But Adam Hadwin at 99, I think, makes a lot of sense. He's 17th in putting over a 100-round sample in bent grass, 19th over the past 50 rounds in strokes gain approach. Can't really argue with that. He's been good on par fours. Um, the I, th- I think he's just – he had a good showing last week. And, again, the balanced lineup is really where I want to go. So I will say I prefer your first mid-priced golfer, but Hadwin is potentially going to be a mainstay of my lineups because of the the balance that he brings. Yeah, the only reason that I went with uh, Joaquin Neiman over Adam Hadwin is that, again, I'm emphasizing distance this week. Hadwin doesn't have that, but he's not going to be a cross-off for me because, as mentioned, like you can win in multiple ways here. So Hadwin is someone I like. I just like Neiman a bit more. So... I do think that I want to go with some balanced lineups, as you alluded to, maybe a a Xander Hovland start. And when I do that, that's going to allow me to get back up into this tier and go with someone like Neiman. And Neiman finally gets back on Bentgrass, which is his only non-terrible surface. He's actually pretty solid on Bentgrass, too. He's gained at least 1.9 strokes in approach in all three events since the end of the COVID-19 layoff. That pushes him up to 14th in this field and approach the past 50 rounds uh, per Fantasy National. He is also 23rd in distance, so checks a lot of boxes statistically. He has played here before. He's played well here before each of the past two seasons, so Neiman fits everything that I want. Uh, He's the last guy for me outside of maybe... Gary Woodland before things fall off a significant amount. Uh, And I'll put Hadwin in there too. But I think that Neiman is kind of the end of a tier to me. Is that kind of how you're viewing him too? Yeah. So I think you have like, really, I can kind of say the top seven for me this week. Yeah. And then there's the tier of the few golfers I'd be okay with in the, the mid to low 10 thousands, like Morikawa, Reed, Sungjae, Neiman, Hadwin, Woodland, and then it's a bump down. So like, I kind of view it as like two larger tiers this week toward the top, and then it yeah. drops off a ton. Um, so I think we're in agreement, if I understand you right. And I just toying around more. Like, I don't really know if I want to go below nine thousand in in my like cash game lineups. Like, I don't know if I do either. But the problem is there aren't a ton of guys in the nine thousands I like either. So. No matter what I do, I'll be in a tier I don't like. 
and that's very yeah. uncomfortable. Like cash game rosters are uncomfortable for this week. Unless you, I mean, you could probably just hover right around that 10,000 range. Uh, do your best with, I mean, if you're okay with like Fitzpatrick at nine, seven, but if you do like Woodland, Hadwin, Neiman, uh, Leishman, who we didn't go talk about. scroll Future. to 10, two, click every name from 10, two to nine, eight or whatever. And just you feel use good. those six guys. Oh, that includes Spieth. Just kidding. Don't do that. Oh. Um, it's not, it's not terrible. It could be terrible, but I, well, anything could be terrible. But <laughs> ah, all right, uh, if, you if you don't do that, you're gonna have to spend down on someone like my second mid-price golfer, and that's Joel Damon. All right, take it away. I mean, uh, I'd love to spend down for Joel Damon. What do you mean? Ninety-three hundred dollars hasn't missed the cut in twenty twenty, the the calendar year, not the season. So I'm sure he's gonna miss this. <laughs> but uh, that's eight straight events where he's played the weekend with six top 20 finishes that's pretty nuts for ninety three hundred dollars is he a good putter absolutely not uh he's gained strokes putting in only three of those eight made cuts but he's gained off the tee in each of them and with approach in seven of the eight he's lost uh strokes tee to green only once out of those eight finishes when he finished 55th at the farmers back in january we always are targeting ball strikers who can't putt that's who joel damon is but he's been doing exactly what that archetype of golfer should be able to do, and that's be really good tee to green and make the cut because you're so good tee to green. And if you make putts, you can finish top 20. If you don't, you're going to finish like 40th and not ruin a lineup. So I think Joel Damon is fine. Uh, I think that there are a few interesting names in this low 9,000 range. But if you don't click on all those golfers between like 97 and, and 10 4, you're going to be down here. At least for at least for one golfer. Yeah. And most likely two or three. Yep. It's unfortunate. <laughs> um, but I think that there are two guys who I, I – there are a couple guys I don't mind. Uh, one of them is Damon. One of them is Corey Connors. And Connors is a disaster on bent grass. Total disaster. But he's been less of a disaster recently. And it's not his worst surface. So, eh. I can justify him at least at ninety two hundred dollars. Uh, Connors, I think the big reason is the same things you discussed for Damon is that he is a stud on approach. Still, he has gained at least two point four strokes in approach in all three events since the resumption of play, and that is even though he missed the cut in one of those. Meaning the sample is just two rounds. Still gained at least two point four strokes in approach in that one. The two events where he has made the cut, uh, Connors has finished twenty first and nineteenth. He has enough distance to grade out well for this course too, and for my process, so. $9,200, you have to take on some concerns for sure, but I'm willing to risk it a bit on Connors here. And I think that he and Damon are the guys who stand out most to me down here. I'm still not in on Jason Kokrak, um, who you had mentioned before, but I think the Harold Varner III is a third option down here. So maybe I I think my distaste is with the like 93 or 94 to 98 range that's the range i think i dislike the most in this field but i think with hv3 connors and damon you've got at least decent options down here yeah i think that they're going to be keys if they make the cut and you get like you know three tier two or above studs that's a pretty high upside lineup because if these guys are making the cut they can do a lot of damage uh, so Damon, Connors, Varner, um, look, Kokrak, despite having pocket aces, pocket kings, and pocket queens. <laughs> which again, again, if he's going to not... cheat, he should cheat better and help me when I use him in DFS. Yeah, I don't think I'm there. Um, I don't want to gloss over Scotty Scheffler entirely at 95. I want to trust the longer sample with him, which is really good, uh, Tita Green. Um, and then there's still... Cameron Champ, who is in, in play for like an upside type of lineup. But I think if you're in the 9,000s overall, uh, below 99, let's clarify. Yeah. Uh, you might as well just jump the whole way down. I agree. Uh, so let's move down to the value tier now. Who stands out to you at $9,000 and below? Um, I think you put this one in here for me because he's your boy, but Ian no, Poulter. No, 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 stop this. No, no, I'm putting my foot down. No. $9,000. Really? 
good short game. Uh, he's 30th in around the green, 11th in putting over the past 50 rounds. That keeps him in play like most weeks, and I think that's something that we'll have to kind of bump up if we want to justify Ian Poulter. But I just really don't like this cheaper range much at all. Um, he's only 68th in approach. He has solid win odds uh, for the price, and that's really kind of why I'm, you know, we're solid win odds in my simulations. Let's clarify. He's 150 to one on FanDuel Sportsbook, but uh, for the price, he stands out a little bit from everyone else. Uh, so, like solid cut odds in a cash game. Again, probably not going below 9,000 unless I really talk myself into like Sebastian Munoz or Carlos Ortiz. Don't know if I'll get there, so I might cap my. Uh, I might I might give give myself a floor of 9,000 in a cash game. I don't think I will. Um, the reason that I'm not on Poulter is uh, the distance. Well, I, was uh, just, I didn't want to justify anything. <laughs> um, I, again, I just dislike the upper 9,000 range, so I'm okay going down here and like giving myself the ability to get back into like the 10,000 range more often. So that's why I probably will go below 9,000. I don't feel great about it, but like, you know going to be here um so the reason i'm not a polter is that i'm emphasizing distance which makes it a bit hypocritical to talk of emiliano grillo but let's talk about emiliano grillo because hey it's a bent grass week so we're back on emiliano grillo because it's the only surface where he's not a total dud he's actually a plus on this surface and that's an addition to the other things that normally draws to grillo he is fourth in the field and approach the past 50 rounds Gained 4.7 on approach at the travelers just a few weeks ago so he's not super long off the tee but not a wet noodle, I guess. Uh, he's 89th in distance, 11th in fairways gain. So that's good. So he's $8,700. I think that Grillo makes sense to me this weekend. Brandon, is there enough here for you to buy into Grillo too, or is it just me? So here's the thing. You can't, I don't think you could play Emiliano Grillo in a cash game. And I don't oh, think I like... going to. This is, these aren't cash game recommendations. <laughs> yeah, but okay. So... These are sure. people I'm going to use this week. <laughs> we need to clarify, though, because, like, I think that, especially if you're new to, to PGA DFS, you are, like, a common question is, like, who's the who's the $7,500 cut maker? And it's like, they, oh, they don't exist. Like, some of these guys are going to make the cut, but that one who's guaranteed to make the cut is not out there. Grillo, at least, is first in the field in opportunities gained, which is a fantasy national stat for birdie chances. <laughs> but he's 98th in birdie or better rate <laughs> gained because he doesn't, he can't putt. Um, so, I mean, yeah, you can only really play him on bent grass. So I think he makes sense, but just be ready to have those Grillo lineups out of commission. On I mean, Saturday. like that's that's a risk for literally anyone when only sixty five out of one hundred fifty five make it, though. Yeah. So if you're gonna if you're gonna chance it, um, for a non cash game, sure, take take a stab on on Grillo. It's not even a stab though. I think that he is going to be like a guy I rotate in decently often in this value range. That's why I'm writing him up. It's not because I think he's a cash game play. It's because I will use him more than a lot of guys for tournaments. I, I mean, I'd rather, I'd rather play Sebastian Munoz at 8,000. I think him. that Munoz is an option for cash games. I will say that. I think he's got a little upside in him as well. He's, he's another really good all around player. Uh, he's my second low price pick at 8,000. Uh, all he doesn't do well really is around the green play, which I am factoring in this week, but it's never the most important thing. He's 34th in the field in strokes gain approach over the past 50 rounds. Can't really ask much more uh, than that from someone at 8,000. He's eighth in opportunities gained. Um, let me try to check and see <laughs> what his conversion is. Well, his, his putting is not bad, so he probably converts seasonally off. 22nd. Yeah. So he's got better cut odds and top 10 odds in my simulations than Grillo. So I'd rather just play Sebastian Munoz and save $700. I mean, that's fine. I like I Munoz too. I won't fight you. So like, over... okay, by this justification, if there is anyone I like more 
So, like, I can't, I'm not going to talk about Patrick Cantlay or Justin Thomas because I like Xander Shoffley. Why not just take the savings and F those guys? I'm never going to talk about them. I, I mean, you know what the difference is. You know, Grillo's no, like, no, there's no difference. Four out of 10 to make the cut. No. I don't think you'd load up on those guys. I mean, you, I'm not, you, I'm you, not loading up on anybody in this tier. Right. I'm going to have more of Grillo than most golfers in this tier. Sure. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, give me Carlos Ortiz and save me $1,100. I can't even find Carlos Ortiz on my sheet. $7,600. Okay, that's fine. <sighs> that's fine. It's fine. You're just you're just boring, you know. Live Although, your life. To, Get to a be transparent. In there. To be transparent, Carlos Ortiz 92nd in opportunities gained, but 29th in birdies gained, which is not necessarily what you want to see either. Mm. Yep, got to cross him off. <laughs> yep. Well, the, let's He's let's out. load up and make Emiliano Grillo a, 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 a core play. Fringe core, yeah. Por qué no? Why not? Let's do it. Uh, my other value play for this week is Brendan Steele. Steele is not good on bent grass. Um, and his sixth place finish a few weeks ago is fully unsustainable because it was fueled by putting. But other stats make him interesting. He fits what I want off the tee, whether you emphasize distance or accuracy. 47th in distance, 43rd in fairways gained the past 50 rounds. That's in addition to ranking 40th in approach. And he can have pop weeks there. So he's gained at least 2.8 on approach in three of the pa- three of eight events since January 1st. He's gained at least 4.8 twice. So again, not a cash game play. I think I might honestly just go Munoz in a cash game. But I do like the upside he brings for tournaments. So... What do you think? Uh, he's probably going to be top ten or miss the cut, similar yeah. to similar to Grillo. Yeah. Um, I don't really have any interest in 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 using him. I just this the the difficulty in projecting and predicting these golfers below nine thousand just makes me not interested. Okay. And but don't use them. Yeah, like, yes, you, some of these guys are going to finish top 10, uh-huh. but the amount of times where it's Emiliano Grillo is not very significant. So I think I think I'm just going to elevate my floor, make my cutoff um, 9,000 pretty harshly aside from uh, Munoz, Ortiz, Ryan Palmer, maybe. I think that's where I am. Okay. Um, I'm okay don't, jumping down there. Again, I think that Munoz is an option for cash games if you need like a cheap guy to give you a lot of flexibility. I'm okay with that. Do, do you want to use Grillo in our head-to-head? No. Okay. I, I said he's not a cash game play. That's a cash yeah, I just, game. I, was just, I, th- I thought maybe it'd be like emotional enough to stand behind it and say yes no i'm not giving out dumb plays i'm giving out what i'm doing and i'm gonna have more (laughs) grillo than most people below nine thousand dollars like that is what it is i'll probably have more steel too i I think the issue here is that we have to talk about golfers below nine thousand so yeah grillo has one of the better cases to be made Okay. I still think, nope, nope, nope. Just stop there. No, 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 no. We're I still good. think he's outside the top three below 9,000. And the amount of golfers I'll have and the, the amount of exposure I'll have to this range, probably not that high. So uh, I'm just not going to use a lot of Emiliano Grillo. And I don't want to talk him up like I think he's the cut maker because. I think he's going to make the cut. How about this? Grillo, you said he's about even odds or 40%, right? Yeah. Give me plus 110 on Grillo to make the cut. No, give me Grillo versus Munoz head-to-head. Fandle okay. points. Sure. All right. But I, I did mention that I'd rather have Munoz in a, in a cash game, so... I can't... I don't know what you want from me. I'm not doing, I'm not doing odds because we just do cumulative bets. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Other guys I like who are like in the Munoz tier. You mentioned Ortiz. That's fine. Um, any interest in Sung Yul No or Cameron Tringali? Uh, so Sung Yul No. Um, his his him... fantasy national stats are digging back from before his mandatory military service, so I wouldn't put a lot of emphasis on those. But his approach numbers the past two events have been decent, and he could be one of those dudes who like perks back up with a layoff. Uh, that was kind of my thought process there. Whereas Tringali, it's more so just the ball striking is really good, and he's eighty two hundred dollars. Tringali is probably fine. Okay. Um, I'm trying to pull up. Uh, Sun Yul knows player page here, um, because the approach numbers have been fine. The off the tee play, okay. I think he's like a. I know he's. I know he finished eleventh at the Travelers, but I, I think. No, I think I'm not looking at the finish. Like that's not. I I think realistically his like what you should expect like is the best case is like 40th so i'm not how about cam tringali against munoz that way we're jumping down and i'm not taking grillo who is 87 whereas i'm getting tringali who's 82 which is more comparable to munoz i feel like you should i I can tell you like you shouldn't be trying to be fair you should be trying to win that bet so okay fine then just do you prefer tringali to, to grillo straight up Mm, no, I'm just trying to make it a more even bet. Mm, I, I feel like <laughs> I think that's not it. But... Okay, then give me Grillo then. So I have Grillo Munoz FanDuel points, correct? Yeah, and okay. I beat you last week on Lonto versus Who won Kogi. the head-to-head? You did. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Weird. It's the only thing that matters. <laughs> the only thing that matters is the thing that I do well in that given week. That is statistically how things work. This is just science. I'm sorry. Uh, win picks for this week. I won the bobble hat because Brandon is trash. So we're going to do one golfer, anyone you want. I'm not crossing off anybody. And then one who is, let me see here. Let's make the cutoff 60 to 1 or longer. I'm going to lop off Woodland. Uh, I get to pick first, so I'm going to go JT. I'm just going to keep with the guy I committed to earlier in the podcast. Um, I will take then. I think Scheffler's interesting. Okay. But I will go uh, with someone I glossed over, but did mention I, I was fine with, especially in a balanced build. Matthew Fitzpatrick. He's 65 to one. Someone picked this Matthew Fitzpatrick on this podcast and it was not me. That might yeah, be I'm first. not usually a huge Fitzpatrick fella, but <laughs> a Fitz fella. Yeah, I'm not, not much of a Fitz fella, but... All right. I'm going to go... Uh... It's between two guys. Let's go... Joel Damon. Did not expect that. Let's have fun. Let's party. Uh, who do you want for your upper person? Xander. So you have Xander and Matty Fitz. I have JT and Joel JT. Damon. What? JD. What? I didn't say D. I said T. <laughs> oh, JD, Joel Damon. Okay. Woof. A little slow there. Um, okay. So we have the, the head-to-head, which is Munoz versus Grillo. I have Grillo. You have Munoz. I have JT and Damon. You have Xander and Matty Fitz. Matthew Fitzpatrick. I have to talk through all these because we have way too much going on this weekend. And we have our head-to-head, which I will win for the third straight week. I am very excited to do so. Any final thoughts for you, Brandon, before we close up shop for today? If you do win for a third time in a row, you will be down only four. <laughs> probably because I've used Grillo in, my, in our head-to-heads. Yeah, probably. So, uh, <laughs> fi- uh, final thoughts. Um, I really think that there are a few very very few interesting value plays i think that the right way to play this one this week is to find balance really try to get that six out of six which should be the goal anyway but i think sometimes we get a little caught up in our uh confidence and ability to 
uh, hit on value plays. And yes, value plays will be toward the top of the leaderboard. It happens every week, but there are a hundred value plays. Some of them are going to be there. You don't want to, uh, you know, get too confident. So I think balance is the right right play this week as opposed to last week. I just finished our our uh, head to head. Cameron Tringali's in it, man. I know you're not going to use him, so I can tell you this outright. Yeah, so, I'm not. Cameron Tringali going to win me the bobble hat this week. I think he's cash game viable. Let's roll, baby. Let's go. What could go wrong with Cam Tringali at $8,200 in cash? I think that it's a week where you want to vary your roster construction. Uh, go with the lineups we discussed where you go JT by himself, can't lay by himself, JT can't lay, go Xander, uh, go Xander Hovland. I think that it's a good week to vary your roster construction and play things that way in order to differentiate your lineups when you're multi entry for tournaments. I might not recommend playing cash games this week personally because I think all cash game lineups are terrible or the ones that I was smelling out during the show. So maybe just don't play cash this week. At least maybe that's just me, but uh, I think it should be a fun weekend. And again, next week will be fun too because it's at the exact same course. Maybe we can learn something, find some buy lows. We'll talk about that again next week. That is all that we have for today. want to thank you all for tuning in. Brandon, if people have questions for you on Twitter or want to mock you after Emiliano Grillo wins, where can they find you there? I'm at Gadula13, G-D-U-L-A-1-3. And I'm at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, front of the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Hopefully your golf lineups go well. Hopefully Grillo makes a cut. And hopefully I get to gloat a little bit on Tuesday. We'll talk to you then. This has been the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, powered by Number Fire.